fact that you discovered that Pfizer, that big pharma, um, was funding community groups um, to to get them essentially to pressure people into taking these these vaccines and um, and to support the mandates. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe it should be obvious that these corporations are, are funding propaganda, um, and, and funding politicians and, and <laughs> whatnot in order to, to push their product. But this was, in this case, it was the president of the what, Chicago Urban League, um, which is an interesting angle for them. So how did you, how did you come across that information? Well, I'm, I write about healthcare and pharma issues. Um, I've only recently written a little bit more about the mandate. You know, I've been, the pandemic has been just unending, interesting political and policy issues. You know, <laughs> early on I was writing about the lack of uh, medical supplies and some of our trade policies around that. Um, later, I was writing about the intellectual property issues around vaccines. You know, we did not allow the creation, the U.S. did not allow the creation of generic vaccines. And then we also hoarded the vaccine in wealthy countries. Japan, Germany, Canada, the U.S. had a lot of vaccine. And we then pressured young people, people who probably didn't even really need it, to take the vaccine while um, people who were immunocompromised or very elderly in the global south went without the vaccine. You know, the, there was a lot of vaccine inequity issues, um, a lot of profit making uh, during the pandemic. And this is, I think, actually um, related to that. Um, looking at Pfizer's disclosures, you know, Pfizer, like a lot of American big pharma companies, has engaged in, you know, off-label um, promotion of, of drugs, you know, encouraging patients and doctors to use their drugs that are, you know, for a purpose that they're not approved for, which is illegal. Mm -hmm. um, and because of some of the settlement agreements that they've signed, they, they've agreed to a, a little bit higher level of uh, disclosure than, than others. And so far, so Pfizer puts out the special disclosure. I took a look at it and started connecting some dots because, you know, that they earmarked money for vaccine promotion, for uh, advocacy around, um, vaccines uh defending the vaccine to all these groups that were not that i was like hey what, what, what are they <laughs> what's going on here because they, they're, they're giving money to like you mentioned the chicago urban league the civil rights group you know money earmarks for promoting the vaccine uh to a corporate watchdog group um the con uh, consume national consumers league uh lots of different patient and doctor organizations that came out of the woodworks to endorse the vaccine mandate and they did so in a very extreme way. They, didn't, they said that there were no exceptions for a prior infection and natural immunity. They said, you know, no matter what, no matter if you're in, if you're, you know, someone in their early 20s who's basically no chance of dying of, of COVID, you know, unless, you know, of course, there are exceptions there. If you have some immunocompromised uh, or some other disease going on, you, 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 may, you might need it. But generally speaking, if you're young, you, you didn't need the vaccine. But they still pushed this policy. And they did, and even if they did so, you know, they would have done this, you know, um, because this is part of their, they, this, what they believe the science showed or ideologically they supported this. The bare minimum is disclosure. You know, we've got, we've got we have decades of research showing that, you know, even there's a, there's an interesting study that came out a while ago that showed that even the, the pharmaceutical practice of giving free pens to doctors that are branded with a, you know, Bristol Myers Squibb or whatever, giving the pens over and over again to a doctor made them psychologically more likely to prescribe that pharma company's drug. So if you're a patient or a doctor or a civil rights group, or, you know, there's a lot of groups that I mentioned in my story, and you're taking this like $100,000, $50,000 Pfizer checks, and you're endorsing a government mandate to force people to take their pharmaceutical product, at the bare minimum, you could disclose. And none of these groups did really, you know, one or two, you know, if you hunted and pecked on their website, you could find it. But when they're engaging in their public advocacy, never mentioned it. And then there were some, like the Chicago Urban League, that has like a big disclosure page on their website where they're like, okay, you know, some banks and airlines fund us, and it was all and, and some other corporations and philanthropies, but no mention of Pfizer when they're engaging in this high-profile campaign to encourage 
uh, the Chicago mandate and, and support for the national mandate. So, you know, it, 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 it's it's a story that I think is is, is interesting because it, it shows how the consent and public opinion around this was manufactured. You know, no one would probably, I don't think people would leap out of their seats to agree with the mandate if they saw that the main group endorsing it was Pfizer, right? Um, but it, it, to, if you want to kind of mobilize public opinion, it's much more efficient as a corporation to work through third party organizations that have credibility, medical credibility, public health credibility, you know, what, what, what have you. Um, yeah. Well, and that appear to have community interests that are, you know, maybe grassroots, grassroots groups that you wouldn't connect to a corporate, you know, you wouldn't think that these people would have like a corporate bias. You would trust these people. You wouldn't think that they would be compromised by money in the way that you would think Pfizer is or, you know, big mainstream media even, right? Yeah, a lot of these groups have a well of uh, trust. You know, they appear as incredibly unbiased that they're concerned primarily for the public interest and that's what's, what's what makes them all the more effective as yeah. you know um at spearheading this corporate policy and you know this isn't necessarily new you know i've done other stories showing that um and there's quite a bit written about this about how the opioid lobby purdue pharma and others increased the prescribing of opioids and the policies around that by working through third party organizations that influence doctors and patients and regulators. And, you know, there's just a long history of this in big pharma and American public health. It's just, this is unique because it's the pandemic and, you know, having a mandate that forces people, you know, at the end of the day, you, you were never really forced to take your Percocets or your Oxycontin, even if they were prescribed unnecessarily for your back pain or whatever. That was, that, that was the result of a covert influence campaign by the opioid industry. What's different here is that, you know, the mandate said that if you didn't take the vaccine, you would get fired. You know, that, yeah. that's much more coercive.